Hello and welcome to the Charles River Conservancy Parkland Show. My name is Renata von Scharner. I'm the founder and president of the Charles River Conservancy. And of course, we always talk about the Charles River, but today we're having a very special guest, Max Rome. Welcome. Thank you so much. And Max is going to talk to us about testing the water, that dirty water that is no longer that dirty. And but that many people say, oh, it's because of the water quality, we can't swim. Well, you will hear the real story That's behind right. it. So, um, as you know, the Charles River Conservancy um, has been looking at uh, a swim park. And you see the red dot, and that is where we're planning to have a swim park. So, Max, tell us, how did you get involved in um, water, water testing? Um, how did you get to that point? Because right now you are a master's student um, at Northeastern in environmental engineering. Yeah. How did you, how did that happen? Well, I've been, I've been really interested in water and studying water for a long time. So I've, I've actually been working doing wastewater treatment, working on wastewater treatment plants and figuring out how to take all of the kind of contamination and nutrients and pathogens out of, you know, out of our sewage. And believe it or not, kind of some of the things that are happening in the Charles River have a lot to do with wastewater treatment. Yeah. And I've been, uh, you know, really interested. I've been following, I grew up in Cambridge and I've been kind of following this swim park project for a long time and just thinking about how exciting it is. And when I saw the opportunity to get involved with this as a researcher, I just uh, jumped at the chance. And I'm really, I'm really excited to be getting to do this research and getting to be out on the Charles every single day during the summer, Good. looking at the water. Good. Yeah, well, and, um, of course, you know that swimming was very much part of it. Yeah. And then um, um, the pools were closed in the 50s. But that's how Magazine Beach looked like. It's unbelievable. And um, so, and so the Charles River Conservancy started the Swimmable Charles Initiative early on when we started. And um, we started off by swim races with the Charles River Swimming Club and then with community swims and you you were part you participated in a community swim that's right it was delightful we went out for the uh me and the two high school students that i was working with we came out for the the city splash this year and the water was cool and refreshing it was clean it was a very delightful day on the charles yeah and so after we did the city splash we then we had now five years of that. We did a feasibility study. And, um, and here is the cover of that feasibility study. Mm. And so in that feasibility study, um, we said we really need to know what a water quality is all about. So we um, found generous donors who said they would be able to help with that. And we partnered with Northeastern and tell us of how how you found out about it and what you're doing now. Yeah, well, I saw the posting. My mother actually sent it to me. She was looking at, at the Charles River Conservancy's website and she said, Max, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> Go do see that. if you're interested yeah. in this. And I was. So um, yeah, I just got, I got right involved and I met with Ferdy Hellweger. He's the professor He's, at Northeastern. Yeah, yes. and, and uh, I kind of knew a little bit about the work that he was doing. So he was kind of on my radar already. And he said, well, this looks good, but the most important thing is, can we get you to start right away? And fortunately I was able to, so I, I kind of, we, we hustled and we got the lab set up in May, or I kind of, mm -hmm. I guess in the beginning of June, and then we got right to, right to sampling to see what, yeah. was, what was going on at the yeah. swim site. Because it was important that we would have a full season, a full swim season of, of sampling. And so uh, it was very fortunate because Ferdy Hellweger had done work. And actually there is a, a show uh, with Ferdy on CCTV that you can find on YouTube. And there's also a wonderful story that Ferdy wrote for a publication called River Stories that you can find on our website, where he describes 
his um, his river on his computer right. and how he can manipulate the quality of the water and, and what influences that. So this is a, a wonderful, a wonderful part. So this is where the swim park is planned for in North Point Park, and and here is a, a, a artist's rendering of that area. So I would like you to describe now. Um, what 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 does the testing of the water? What does that entail for you um, during the swim season? Yeah, so I, I think the the first thing that I would say is, you know, based on a lot of work that's been done before, we know that the major contaminants of concern in the Charles River come from one, they come from wastewater that's getting to the Charles River, and two, they're related to these harmful algal blooms. So for this first summer, that was what I focused on. And to kind of, as a proxy to understand how much wastewater, kind of how much, you know, human contamination is in the river, we test for this organism called E. coli, which is a bacteria that, you know, doesn't, doesn't kind of survive and thrive in the river on its own, but it's there if it's getting washed into the river mm -hmm. um, on something else. And the, yeah. the, the other thing that we test for is... Uh, cyanobacteria and yeah. we'll talk more about that. And, and so obviously there are other groups um, like CRWA and also MWRA who do testing in the river. Um, so the site you're looking at is right in the middle there. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, I think that I think the really interesting thing about this sampling, a lot of work has been done on the Charles River to, you know, to see what is the water quality. And what that work has shown consistently is that the water quality really changes. It changes week to week, it changes month to month, and it changes location to location. So in preparation for the swim park project, it's obviously really important to understand on a very granular daily level, what is the water quality at this location? And this, what this graphic shows is it shows our location, and then it shows the kind of two closest locations that are monitored by the Charles River Watershed Association. Yeah, and so you have all their data, you have all the data from MWRA, from EPA, but nobody really tests, has really tested right at the, at the North Point Park. That's right, that's right. And um, there has been testing done by Northeastern University before on the Esplanade. So this is your um, thesis advisor. Yeah, these are my yeah. predecessors. So this yeah. is in 2010, uh, there was a group that did a bunch of work to try and look at a couple different sites and say, you know, which of these sites are most suitable for swimming. And then also to look and see, you know, how much is the water quality changing based on rain? Mm -hmm. um, so, so the work that I'm doing is kind of building on, building on the work yeah. that, that they did. Yeah. So describe to us, you go every, every morning during the swim season, you bicycle down. That's to the right. River. Every morning I, you know, wake up, make myself a cup of coffee. Then I get on my bike and I ride. I live in, in Lower Alston and I ride, I ride down the Cambridge side over to North Point Park. Um, I take out my sampling bottles, you know, take a good look at the, at the river, see what's happening. And I pull a hundred milliliter sample um, from the river bike it over to the lab at Northeastern, and then I do, I do two things with it. First, I prepare the sample, yeah, this is it, um, with, a, with a reagent using an E. coli testing system called, uh, called the coli alert. So it's a, it's a- Say that again? Coli alert. Coli alert, like okay. E. coli alert, alert. Something, okay. something in there. So this is a system you know, basically what you're doing is you're adding a special reagent to your sample and that reagent is a food for both coliform bacteria and specifically E. coli. And when the coliform bacteria eat that food, they produce something that reacts with the reagent that turns yellow. And when the E. coli eat that food, they produce something that reacts with the reagent and glows under ultraviolet light. So what you, the image that you're seeing is, um, is an image of kind of an, a typical sample that shows kind of a low level, those glowing blue cells, those are the cells that E. coli is in. 
and then you know the the image on the left is kind of a typical Charles River sample with low levels of E. coli and the image on the right is a sample that was taken directly from um, an overflow pipe during a mm -hmm. rainy day. I see. I think this is a good a good illustration of just how dirty, how much dirtier the kind of rainwater overflow sewage yeah. is. Than, yeah. So then, then you chart it. And what we have here is at the bottom, you might want to tell us what the what the parameters are of this chart. Yeah, so this is this is our E. coli data. This is about you know ninety consecutive days of sampling, and you know what you've got you've got the dates on the x-axis and on the y-axis you have the the number of E. coli in a hundred milliliters, and pretty much what this you know what this is showing us is that kind of throughout the summer. E. coli concentrations really stayed in the 10 to 20 range, you know, with a couple kind of higher events, one event that was all the way up to uh, to 77. And the, the red line that's at the top, that's kind of the important the line. The horizontal line, that's yes. From, yeah, that's the, that's the five day threshold. So if the five day average exceeds that line, you've got a problem if you're a public swimming beach. Yeah. So. You interpret that this, I mean, anybody reads that can tell we were, we had a very good summer. Yeah, we had a great summer. I mean, and that's what's, it's so pleasant that we've got a graph that's really easy to understand. Yeah. Because we did not approach, we did not approach that limit. And, the, and no. from, from an E. coli perspective, the, the river was really safe to swim. And North then North you, you compared um, your data, um, you looked at previous years and actually in that location, it was also very good. Yeah. So this so this data comes from CRWA, and it is you know they didn't sample at North Point Park, but they sampled at two locations close to North Point Park, and you know this is kind of a small subset of a of a bigger data set, and but what you can see here is that for the last four summers, water quality has been consistently really decent. It's in the been, summer. I in, think in that's the, the, the summer. In the summer. In the summer at this location, yep. water quality is good. Water quality is meeting swimming standards. And this kind of answers the question of is is our data aberrant? Was this just a good year? And this graph pretty strongly indicates no, this was a this was a normal year. Yeah and so, so summers are much better than winters. And that's why yeah. uh, it's sometimes misleading to take the average of a whole year because you don't swim in the winter and so it's less relevant what the quality is in the winter. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Also, it's not as nice to swim in the winter. Yes. So, so, um, so this was the E. coli. So what's the other, um, what's the, what else do you, do you test? Yeah, so the other thing that we're paying attention to is cyanobacteria which people may know as blue-green algae, and maybe some people have heard about harmful algal blooms. And uh, so cyanobacteria is a really, really interesting organism. It's an organism that's, you know, two to three billion years old, kind of the first creature that figured out how to produce oxygen on our planet. And in those two to three billion years, they figured out some really good tricks for uh, surviving and thriving and kind of making use of nutrients and light to do their thing. And unfortunately, one of the tricks that they figured out is that they produce this whole suite of, uh, of what are called cyanotoxins. So these are these kind of exotic compounds that they put out into the water to help them compete with other algaes. And they're not just, not just one, there's a whole range of them. I think you depict two here. Yeah, so these are these are these are two of the most common cyanobacteria that we see on the Charles River: Anabina, Aphenazominin, and then the third is Microcystis. Um, and and I mean they're really interesting, but both of them form these form these colonies, these kind of specialized colonies that help mm -hmm. them um, grow quickly. And these are the colonies that kind of raft up and when there's really a bloom happening, you'll see kind of a thin, a thin wisp 
of something green on the surface of the water, almost looks a little bit like pollen on the surface of the water. And those are kind of these mega accretions of mm -hmm. phenosome in it. And, and it has been, it, there was, this summer, there was an occurrence of, of it in the, in the lagoon. And, uh, but we will look at, at, at your site, North yeah. Point Park. But it also happens in, in other places as well. I think not just in the Charles. Yeah, so, so these algal blooms are a really big problem all over the world. Uh, you know, they're ha in the US, they're a big problem in the Great Lakes. They're a really big problem, as some people know, in, uh, in Long Island Sound. And, you know, basically wherever kind of the built environment is introducing extra nutrients and kind of disturbing the, the aquatic environment, kind of one of the ways that nature is responding to that disturbance is by giving this huge bloom of cyanobacteria mm -hmm. that can kind of kind of suck up those nutrients and kind of take advantage of these unusual conditions to, to reproduce. So obviously nutrients um, are a component of, and, and temperature also. I think yeah. the warmer the water, the more likely um, they are happen to, to, to blossom. Yeah, and that's kind of what we can see in this next slide. Maybe that's a perfect segue. So when we went out and did our sampling this summer, you know, one thing that's really obvious is when the bloom starts. And it's it's August 1st that, you know, those cyanobacteria... That's suddenly the vertical yeah, column there. They yeah. set their calendar to August 1st. They all kind of you know, got the memo and they started growing like gangbusters. Um, and, you know, and why does that happen? Well, they wait, you know, I think it's, it's a, it's a function of kind of temperature and the season and they kind of wait until the conditions are just right to, to do their thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, so again, at the, at the bottom in the horizontal column, you have the dates where we see on, on, on August 1st, it suddenly starts to, to grow. And tell us what's on the vertical column and what what's the, the, the orange line at the top there. Yeah, so the, the, the standard way that people talk about concentration of cyanobacteria is they talk about cells per milliliter. And we literally count these cells on a tiny little glass slide that's gro broken up into a thousand different sections and we go through the microscope and count how many cells are in each section and then we multiply to figure out how many are in one milliliter and the the threshold there's a there's kind of a human safety threshold that's set for cyanobacteria and that threshold is 70,000 cells per milliliter so we didn't actually ever see that high of a concentration at our site, you know, in the in all the samples that I pulled, I, I never counted seventy thousand cells. Mm -hmm. So how explain? How do you count so many? So you take a smaller area and then multiply it. Yeah, by... that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. So we've got a, we've got it's called a Sedgwick rafter cell, and it's a, uh, it's a, it's just a gridded cell that has a total volume of, of one milliliter and it's divided into a 20 by 50 grid. So depending on what, how high the concentrations are, you'll either do a 50 count, so you'll just go across once, or if they're really high, you might do a 20 count, or if they're low, you might go across a couple more times. Mm. And what, what we do is we take a picture of every single cell that has cyanobacteria in it, and then we kind of carefully go through those images and kind of do a combination of counting and estimating to figure out how many cells are in each are in each slide, and then simply you know how many how many cells did you count out of how many squares multiply that up and then you find the concentration mm. per milliliter. Yeah. So let let's go back to let's go back to um, um, this image. So now that we know you did all the counting and all the counting you did showed that you were uh, way below the level that the Department of Health recommends. So explain again how, how, does, how does the Department of Public Health handle those, um, those readings? Yeah, so the Department of, I mean, this is my understanding, we may have viewers who, who know even more about this, but 
but my understanding is that really thinking hard about the public health risk posed by cyanobacteria is not is not something that people have been doing for as long as we've been thinking about things like E. coli mm -hmm. and uh, kind of fecal contamination. So what the Department of Health has, and this kind of comes from all the way from the federal level, is they simply have an advisory level. And this advisory level is based on a lot of research that suggests, you know, if we spend an hour in the water that has a concentration of 70,000 cells per milliliter, you know, we have X higher chance of getting sick than if we weren't, you know, if we weren't in that water. Mm -hmm. And and that's where it comes from. So this isn't, this isn't um, a kind of a hard regulation the same way that the, that the E. coli limit is. This is just a, just an advisory mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. But I think, but I, but for us, I think the takeaway really is you know, when we look at the Charles River and we look at all the work that's been done to clear to clean up the Charles River, you know, we can see a lot of a lot of the success has come in reducing the bacterial contamination that's associated with wastewater, but there's still a serious challenge that's related to these harmful algal blooms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But according to this chart, we could have swam all through the summer in that location. Yeah. 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 So, um, I I just heard that um, Northeastern also offered you to do a PhD. So I'm delighted. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. So that's yeah. wonderful. So Let's you'll see. be testing um, as part of your masters. You'll be testing next summer, and so that I'm delighted that you will stay with the Charles and Northeastern yeah. and and Professor Hellreger. Yeah. To, to continue your work. So that's very exciting. Yeah, and we're really excited. We've got some kind of cool ideas about what we're going to try and put together for next summer. And we're going to try and get a really good kind of time series understanding of what's happening at that spot, you know, both in terms of the algal bloom and also in terms of kind of nitrogen that's in the water and phosphorus in the water and temperature. So hopefully maybe next year we can have the same conversation. We can say, you know, what do we know now about what's causing these yeah, problems to happen? Yeah, so you might wonder what else is happening as we get ready for swimming. So obviously the water quality and, and Max's work are, are very crucial and we are very grateful that we can do that. Um, but we are also um, now engaging marine engineers to look um, to see how we can create a, a temporary platform um, just like Paris and Copenhagen have their platforms where there is swimming in open water. So we would like to see that happening on the Charles and we were pursuing that. And, uh, and so we continue that and in case you just joined us um, and are interested in that subject, you can go to the YouTube and this show will be put on YouTube. And you will find on YouTube there's also a show with Jennifer Gilbert, who is the chair of the Swimmable Charles Committee. And as I mentioned, Ferdy Hellweger, who has talked on this show about his water testing. So we are doing all kinds of things. And uh, many of you are familiar with the, our volunteer program, our volunteers. We have 2,000 of them every year. And they collect debris. And, and that debris then doesn't go into the water. So that also helps the water quality, which sure is an important contribution. Um, so all, all these aspects are part of making the parklands more active, attractive and accessible. And we feel swimming is very much part of that, as well as bicycling and running and skateboarding. This um, swim park, as we call it, will just be upriver from the skate park that we built and it opened in 2015. And um, it will be accessible, the swim park, just like the skate park, will be easily accessible by public transportation and by obviously by bicycle and will be a wonderful asset for the river. Is there anything else you, you want to make sure people understand about water quality? Um, you mentioned um, the Deer Island, that might be a fun a, a fun outing for people to 
to undertake. Oh yeah, if you ever get the chance to go take a tour of Deer Island, it's really, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I just found out that, so the average flow from Deer Island is 130 million gallons per day, and the average flow from the Charles River is 3.85 million gallons per day. Wow. So, so you've got, you know, you've got almost 50 times more water kind of coming out our city streets, kind of being shunted out nine miles out into the ocean than we have flowing through the Charles River. Yeah, yeah, and you described the process as something kind of magical and really very basic of what it's makes it possible for absolutely. us to live in a city. Absolutely. A mixture of biology, chemistry, um, That's right. all engineering, a lot of things. A lot of the same things that are happening in the Charles, but sped up. Yeah. So thank you, Max. Um, we are coming to the end of the show. And if you have questions, please um, let us know that my email is coming up or, or go to the website of the Conservancy to learn more about swimming and what we're doing with the testing. So thank you for watching and see you later. Thank you, Max. Thank you.